Romans chapter number 2 we'll begin reading in verse number 21 the Bible says thou therefore which teachest another teachest thou not thyself thou that preachest a man should not steal dost thou steal thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery dost thou commit adultery thou that abhorrest idols dost thou commit sacrilege thou that makest thy boast of the law Though breaking the law dishonoreth thou God? For the name of God is blaspheme among the Gentiles through you as it is written. Now, we don't have time to start all the way back at verse number one in this chapter to catch up to where we're at. I'll do my best to summarize. Okay, the Apostle Paul, chapter number two of the book of Romans, starts dealing with those that put their faith in the law. Okay, they have rejected Christ. They still believe that so long as they keep the law, that they'll be justified in the eyes of God. And the Apostle Paul's doing his best by the Holy Ghost to uh, uh, shake their foundations a little bit and shatter their glass house. Uh, beginning, we get down to oh, verse number 11, 12, somewhere in there. It talks about those that judge another without judging themselves. And then it talks about how it doesn't matter whether you're Jew, you're Gentile, doesn't matter if he's, you know, redhead, blonde, brunette, anything in between. Okay, doesn't matter if you was born into this family or born into that family or who was your teacher, who wasn't your teacher. God is no respecter of persons, verse number 11 tells us. Right, those that do wickedly in the eyes of God will not escape judgment. Those that do righteously in the eyes of God, they shall be rewarded. If not in this life, then certainly in the next on both accounts. And then he gets into, truly, the difference between the law and being set free through Jesus Christ. If the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. He says the law, right, if to put your faith in the law means you must fulfill the whole law. There is no halfway measure when it comes to the law. Either you kept it or you didn't. Okay, it goes also on to say that in verse number 17, right, behold, thou art called a Jew and resteth, or restest, in the law, and maketh thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approveth the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. He's saying the law instructs you to not put your faith in the law, but it instructs you out of the law into Christ. The law is to show you that you are not perfect. You can never be perfect. And it points you towards the one that is altogether lovely. The law itself testifies that one day God's going to send his lamb. The law does not say that the law shall deliver you. It says that the law is what God's definition of holiness is. It also says you can't be holy, and then it gives you a way to push back the wrath of God, not to erase it, not to get rid of it. It gives you a way that until God makes his perfect way, you can still be in the grace and the favor and the protection of Almighty God. It doesn't say that the law will make you holy. It just says that the law says that you're not holy, and until God makes a way that we can be holy the law is the best that we have it was always pointing to something different something better okay well then we get to verse number 21 okay now he's talking to the leaders of the Jews he says thou therefore that teachest another teachest thou not thyself thou that preachest a man should not steal dost thou steal he starts dealing with hypocrisy now keep in mind he just said that the law teaches you out of the law. It directs you to something different. In this day and age, the teachers were solely focused upon teaching what the law said. Right? They were keeping the letter of the law. That's what they were teaching. But they were not teaching the spirit of the law. Let me give you an example. He says, don't steal. But what steal? needs to take something that's not yours. Get, well, 
Is it still stealing if you convince somebody to give you something that you know that you don't need? Does that steal? Well, Brother Jordan, that's not, I didn't take anything. They gave it to me. Well, I mean, Tom Sawyer hood worked a whole bunch of boys into painting a fence for them. That doesn't mean that he didn't rob them of their time. But in fact, he convinced them that it'd be so much fun because he didn't want to do it. Now, you're going to have the time of your lives painting this fence, boys. And they believed him. So why did he still end up getting in trouble for it? Because he did it the wrong way. He robbed them, boys. They were teaching the letter, the letter of the law. Don't take anything that's not yours. But how much were these teachers and professors and Pharisees and Sadducees and the judges, how much were they still stealing from the people? Because they weren't teaching the spirit of the law. Okay, we like the nowadays when we go back and we, you know, condense the Ten Commandments. We say, thou shalt not lie. That's not what the Ten Commandments say. Ten Commandments say, thou shalt not bear false witness. Amen. That's a whole lot more than just not telling the truth. Amen. That's standing by and letting somebody tell a lie without correcting it. Because you being present and not rebuking it that gives your silent consent to whatever was just said. Right? You're bearing witness to the fact that, well, because that guy said something, I believe it's true. I'm not going to say nothing to it. Right? And you guys do know at weddings, they still do say that line. Well, sometimes they do. Some people are smart enough not to let the line be said. But if anyone has any reason why these two should not be wed, speak now or forever hold your peace. Right? That's an invitation to say, if you got something to say, say it now or shut up for forever. Right? The same is true about your life. Either you silently endorse things or you stand up and you say, no, that's not right. Now, there are times that we don't know. Right? But if you do know and to say nothing, you ought to know better. See, this is what the law was meant to do. The law was meant to be our schoolmaster's show. It's not just, well, here's a list of things that you're supposed to do. The law was to teach us and instruct us how God said we ought to live. There's some 600 and something laws, but there's a whole lot more going on than just do this and not do this. The purpose of the law, as we've already read, was to get us to something better than the law. That was Christ. Well, what did Christ? Christ says the whole law is fulfilled in this. Love the Lord thy God with everything you got. And then the second great commandment was to love thy neighbor as thyself. Now see, we find that thou shalt have no other gods before me in the law. We find that there should be no idols, there should be no graven images, that we shouldn't set anything up in the house of God that isn't what God said to set up in the house of God. And then we also find that we shouldn't rob, that we shouldn't commit adultery, we shouldn't lust after the things of uh, our neighbor, that we shouldn't covet the things that our neighbor has. But in truth, what does that all boy do? Jesus summed it up perfect because he was perfect. You're supposed to love God supremely. And then you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself, not as you want to be treated. Right? I'm perfectly fine if everybody leaves me alone and just you know lets me stay in my bunker. Okay, that, I'm fine with that. But no, we're supposed to love thy neighbor as thyself. That means all the things that you do for yourself and you know you ought to do for yourself. Because some of us, we're just miserable and sorry and we don't do the things that we know we're supposed to do anyway. But no, you're supposed to love your neighbor as thyself. What does that mean? Well, it means that you're not going to steal, but it also means that you love that your neighbor regardless of who it is, enough that if they try to give you something that you don't deserve, you're going to protest. Now, you keep that. I don't deserve that. And says, hey, well, I don't want to rob someone of a blessing by letting them give something to me. If you don't deserve it, it's not going to be a blessing to you. Right? Go look at what happened to Achan. He thought he deserved a you know, wedge of gold, some silver pieces, and a Babylonian garment. You know what it got him? Him and his whole family stoned. 
Was there value in it? Yeah, there was some, some value to it. That's why he desired it. Maybe that Babylonian garment, he thought, I'm going to put this thing on, strut around town, be the peacock. Right? Everybody's going to see me coming. Everybody's going to think, wow, look at that garment. Where'd he get that? From a place that God told him not to get it from. And all the value that he thought was in it, what was it? It wasn't a blessing to him. Right? In fact, the reason that he and his whole family were stoned is because one disobeyed and tried to hide it from the rest of them. They went out to battle and a whole bunch of men died. Achan and his family died not because they took the, but because they concealed it because they knew it was wrong. And because there was sin in the camp, when the army went out, other people died as a result of what they did. You say, well, Brother Jordan, that's, that's very serious. Yes, that's very serious. But by you receiving something that you know you have no entitlement to, right? by letting somebody do unto you what you know isn't God's will, you're robbing that person and you're robbing yourself. They may have been willing to give it, but you're robbing them of what God gave to them. Then you're robbing yourself because if you take anything that you know God doesn't want you to have in your life, what's that going to do? Well, a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. Right? Rust starts out in one spot. What's it do? It, you got to get the rust out in order to save the rest of the metal. If there's even the smallest little bit of rust left, guess what's going to happen? The whole thing's going to rust. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? Just to receive, you don't have to go out and take it, but to receive something that you know isn't yours. But the law instructs us that we ought not have anything except what God said we should have. Keep in mind, Achan, not, you know, he was one of them that came out of Egypt. They only left with all the spoils of Egypt. He didn't need any more gold. He didn't need any more silver. He had all the fine garments that came out of Egypt with him. He had all the livestock that they took out of Egypt. What do you say? God took care of Achan. Achan just got greedy. He knew God said not to take it, but he took it anyway because he wanted it more than he was afraid of God. What was he doing? He was robbing God of this, you know, fellowship. When we sin, you know, we're, we're robbing God of what is rightfully His. That's what the law was. That's the big lesson of the law: to do different than what God says, you're robbing God. In fact, the New Testament teaches that because of sin, we were at enmity with God. That means that we were the enemy of God. So to sin is to commit an act of war against God that's why sin will send you to hell because you chose to commit an offense against an almighty thrice holy God sin is a direct testament to what was started in the garden which is God's a liar isn't that what Satan told her you shall not surely die or it's either God's a liar or God won't do what he said he would do. What's that? That's a liar. Or that God isn't God. Because to believe the serpent means that the serpent knew something that God didn't. Which means God wouldn't have been all-knowing. Which means God wouldn't have been God. So in order to see, you either have to deny that God is who he is. Or you have to deny or reject what God said. And either call him a liar or say that God didn't know the whole story. Do you understand that to the one that was before there was anything? Because he said, I am the Alpha. He was around long before time, long before anything else. When you say, well, God didn't mean what he said. God didn't know what he was talking about. Or God didn't tell us the whole story. Even if God didn't tell you the whole story, that's God's prerogative. He's God. But God has not kept, in fact, the Bible tells us that God hath not withheld anything from us that was given to Christ. Jesus said, I've called you friends, and because you're my friends, I've, told, I've given unto you everything that the Father has given unto me. You know what that means? We know everything 
that God needs us to know. Now there's a whole lot more that God wants us to know. We're going to know that when we get on over into heaven. But we can't receive that yet in these sin-cursed, limited minds that we have. we got to wait for a body like Christ. But the whole purpose of the law was not just to teach you how you ought to behave. The purpose of the law was to show you that one, God desires what's best for you. It's not about keeping the rules. It's about developing a lifestyle that is pleasing unto God. It's not just about not taking what isn't yours. It's about not desiring to take what doesn't belong to you. You know why God said not to steal? Because eventually we come to find out that godliness with contentment is great gain. Being able to receive what God wants you to have and be content with it where you don't desire anything else to where all I want is I want God and whatever God gives me that's the purpose of the law you know what Christ desired to do the will of the Father Amen. show me where Christ ever asked for a pillow in fact the Bible says that his pillow was a stone show me where he asked for a tent to stay in no he's sleeping in the bottom of a ship that's about ready to capsize because it's taking on so much water by the way how could Jesus be sleeping in the bottom of a boat that's taking on so much water that they think it's going to sink where do you think the water goes to the bottom Jesus had it all they was just freaking out but the purpose of the law was not to develop a what's the word I'm looking for like a regiment Okay, of people looking out at everybody else's lives. Don't do that. That's what God calls sin. That was not the purpose. The purpose of the law was to instill in us the same desires that were shown and revealed in Christ. David being a type of Christ. What did he desire? He was a man after God's own heart. What did Jesus desire? He desired to do the will of the Father, to fulfill the heart of the Father. He already knew the heart of the Father because he was one with the Father. But he desired to do it. What was the law meant to do? It was to foster a greater love for a holy God that would have been justified in throwing us off the face of the world. But instead, he chose to love us and make a way that one day we could be like him. The law wasn't that answer, but the law was the stepping stone. Because without the law, Christ wouldn't have been able to prove that he was holy. Yeah, but we get back into verse number 23 does thou make us the boast of the law through breaking the law dishonorest thou God for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written the big indictment here is that because of their hypocrisy those that clung to the law and said the law makes me holy because I keep the law well you teach the law but do you really keep it that was the first question and then the second question is when you don't when you are a hypocrite you do realize that by saying one thing and doing another the very name of God is blasphemed among those that don't know God because those that claim to know God don't do what God said to do the Apostle Paul saying, and because of those that say they know Jesus, those that do know him, when they go out to the Gentiles, they've got a harder job because people say, well, they say that they know God and they don't live the way that Jesus lived. Yeah, we know that. We've been preaching to them too. They just don't want to listen. But see, the very name of God was blasphemed. That's a sin that a lot of people don't teach on. That's a sin that in the Old Testament God took very seriously. If you blaspheme God, there's on occasion there was a couple of people that did it and they dropped dead. To blaspheme God is to directly contradict what God said about himself. You know what God said he was? He said he was holy. A holy God doesn't entertain those and a holy God doesn't write down a law that has loopholes in it. A holy God's law 
makes no room for hypocrites. So to see those that go out and live like hypocrites, what do you do? You're blaspheming the very name of God. My God says that I can do this and get away with it. Then your God's not the God of the Bible. Your God isn't the God of heaven. Because we've already... Re God's no respecter of persons. Doesn't matter if you're Jew, Greek. Doesn't matter if he's Gentile or born in to the same family that the Apostle Paul was born into. Boy, he was a Hebrew of the Hebrew, he said. What's that mean? He had the reputation that everybody else aspired to. But yet, even in that state, what did he find? He found that on the road to Damascus one day, he was kicking against the pricks and persecuting the very one that he thought he was serving. What do you have to do? He had to admit that he is wrong. Uh, well, all that being said, verse number 21. Let's go back there. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? That is a question. It is a rhetorical question. Because if you are a teacher, surely in order to teach others, you must first know it. Right? That is the one requirement to teaching. Okay, I don't care what degrees you got. I don't care, you know, whether you're trying to teach somebody how the particle accelerators work over there in Europe or anything else. Or if you're trying to teach a kid how to tie their shoes. The one requirement is you got to know how to do it in order to teach somebody else how to do it. You must first know it. So when he says, those of you that are teaching, he says, Aren't you teaching yourselves? Surely in order to tell somebody else what's right, you had to learn what was right before that. But, true teaching, you can ask Mr. Rod in the back, he was involved in administration of schools in Ohio. Okay, so you can't blame him for me because I went to school in Kentucky. He was in Ohio, okay? But, you can ask him, the purpose of education is not just to teach, but to cultivate a pattern of behavior in somebody's life. What good is it to teach someone how to do something because you know they're going to need it in their life? Right? As much as I said that I never needed algebra in my life, I do need to know how to do basic math. Okay? I do need to know whether or not I'm being robbed at the cashier counter because nowadays they don't know how to do math. They're looking at a computer screen that says, give them one of the bills that has a one on it and one with a five and then two of the George Washingtons and then one of the JFKs, right? Or one of the FDRs. Okay, they have no idea how to do change anymore. So if you don't know how to do change, you're just taking their word that they didn't rob you. Right. But, the whole purpose behind teaching is you're giving someone a tool because it is beneficial to them. True teaching is not just saying, okay, here's everything you're going to need in your life, bye-bye. True teaching is showing them how to use the tool and then make sure that they have mastery over that tool. Okay, we was on a cruise ship. Saw a whole bunch of little infants. They had Velcro shoes. Okay, don't blame them for that. They're infants. They don't know how to tie shoes yet. They're babies. Okay, and infants kick a lot when you try to put them in one spot and keep them from moving. So I understand the parents saying, nope, we're just going to go with the Velcro. Okay. But eventually that kid's going to put shoes on that has laces. For the time, the Velcro is a tool that is convenient. It is not the end product. Okay, sometimes you teach on this because in order to get to this, you got to understand this. Baby is never going to be able to tie its own shoes if it doesn't have hand-eye coordination. If it doesn't have, you know, mobility and dexterity of fingertips. Okay, that's why instead of putting kids in front of televisions for 18 hours a day, like some people do, right, get them some toys. Get them some, I had Legos. Okay, now granted, Legos were a problem sometimes because I decided that I wanted to build something that was bigger than my imagination, right? We'd run out of Legos, okay? Or I'd leave Legos out in the night and then somebody would step on them, 
Okay? But, hand-eye coordination. Okay, the ability to sit in a chair, bend over to where you can tie your shoe without being so top-heavy as a child that you just end up doing a headstand. Right? Because kids' heads are this big and their bodies are this big. Okay, we got to wait for them to be able to be in a position to learn how to tie their shoes. So sometimes you're teaching here so that you can build off of it later. So when the Apostle Paul asked in verse number 21... Teachest thou not thyself? Really what he's asking them is, how in the world are you teaching other people if you don't have the basic building blocks? Because in order to teach more complex things, you have to have mastered the simpler things. Because if you didn't learn how to use your fingers, how in the world are you going to tie your shoes? Okay, if you can't tie your own shoes, how in the world are you going to teach all the Boy Scouts about all these different knots that they're supposed to know how to tie? Right? If you're walking around with untied shoes, I'm not trusting you to teach me the knot that I'm supposed to use to hang off the side of a cliff and not die. Okay, your shoelace came untied. Right? I don't, I'm not trusting the knot you just taught me how to tie off the side of a mountain. Right? Double knot it. Takes care of it. But in all seriousness, in this day and age, those that were teaching had some of the biggest problems with the simplest things. Certainly, if you're going to get up and you're going to teach about how God expects you to be holy, right? You know, let me, let me do it this way. Brother Doug got up and taught about tithing and everybody in the church knew that the pastor didn't tithe, how much would you believe him? For the record, pastor tithes and gives an offering. How do you know? I'm the guy that records it so that you get your tax sheet every year. Okay? But in all truth, right, if I were to get up and to tell you, here's the colors of the rainbow that match, so that when you come to church, you don't look like an abstract painting, okay, but the clothes that I was wearing that day didn't match, why would you believe me? I've said it before, I would not go to a dentist that has gingivitis. Okay, may not have been his fault. He may have done everything right and still got it. Doesn't matter. I'm not going to him. But if you can't master the simple things, why do I trust you to yank things out of my mouth and put something else back in? But I would not go and fly with Pilate that was afraid of turbulence. I, I took two flights. Both times we hit a little bit of... I don't mind turbulence myself. Okay, I don't mind when the boat rocks when you're on the cruise ship. That's fun to me. Everybody else in the family hates it. They're all wearing the motion sickness patches. Okay, I don't know what happened. It's just I didn't get that part of the gene. Okay, But when the plane's doing this... It doesn't bother me if Yehu back in row 82 or whatever it was starts screaming his head off. Okay? He's just a pansy. Now, that doesn't bother me. There's pansies. I've seen pansies. I've met that there's pansies everywhere, right? If he's screaming his head off because the plane went in the middle of the air, doesn't bother me. Now, if the pilot starts screaming like that, then it bothers me. That's supposed to be routine for him. Right? Well, as comical as that is, how comical do you think to the world it is when something that happens to everybody each and every day upsets your apple cart and then you go pout on the side of the road instead of carrying your cross for Jesus the rest of the day? Amen. You try to teach others, teach us out not thyself. You want to talk to other people about it? Well, in order to have a truly productive life you've got to put Jesus for, first but the first phone call that you get about a family member you haven't seen in 19 years that in all truth forgot who you were but you find out that they got the flu you've got to drop everything fly out to them and take them you know cold and flu medicine yourself but you say well was that putting Jesus first because in order to do that you had to drop everything that Jesus told you to do that day Teach us out of thyself. 
We teach the youngins not to go around and not talk about people, but yet we talk about people in the church, you know, eat them up and spit them back out again. Teach us out, not thyself. Here, he talks about very basic things. Don't steal. Don't commit adultery. Right? And don't worship idols. Don't commit sacrilege, as he puts it. Those are some pretty basic things. But yet, how many of the Pharisees worship themselves rather than worshiping God? That's sacrilege. You know, we can go over to where Jesus said, if thou desirest the woman in thine heart, that you've committed adultery already. They weren't teaching that rule at the time. They were teaching, as long as you don't do it, you're not guilty of it, which is true. Right? But Jesus said, if you've even desired it, you've got the problem down here. The problem isn't in the action. The problem's in your heart. What was the law supposed to teach? That we're supposed to have a heart that God was pleased with. That was the purpose of the law. They's missing the underlying message. They're saying, just don't do it and you'll be okay. What's more than just not doing it, how about not desiring to do it? How about having desires that in your heart, in your mind, in your life, that God was pleased with? They were teaching the letter. They weren't teaching the purpose. They had not taught themselves. Because if they had taught themselves, they would have known what God desired and expected of them. In fact, we can go through many occasions in the Old Testament. Probably the most fitting example. God looked everywhere and he was desiring a man that would stand in the gap and make up the heads. That was somebody that not just said that they were doing what God wanted them to do. That was somebody that said, I'm going to take care of everything that I need to do in my life. And then I'm going to go the extra mile to stand in a hedge that is not mine. Fill the gap with me. That means I got to deal with all the problems until the hedge is fixed. And then I'm going to fix the hedge to make sure nothing can get back through it again. What was that? That's a desire to do not just what I'm supposed to do, but to get the hedge back to what God said it was supposed to be. Because if the hedge is broken, those that aren't prepared, they're going to have to deal with things that they're not prepared for. It's what a hedge is for, to protect. So when it comes to teaching, first thing, right, if you're going to teach yourself, if you're going to teach others, first thing you got to do is you got to deal with being equipped. Okay? If you're in kindergarten, they tell you to bring crayons and construction paper. Okay? By the time you get to high school, they want you to have a calculator that can, you know, d decide how many calories you need to eat for the day and be able to do one plus one equals two. Okay? It's got to be able to draw graphs on a screen this big that somehow you're supposed to be able to take that and then put it onto a graph this big on a piece of paper. That doesn't make sense, but they want you to do that. Okay? They want it to be able to do a whole bunch of things that used to, you had to do by hand. Okay, so thank the Lord for the Texas Instruments calculators. Okay, that's what got me through. But, equipment, very important. You cannot teach someone if they're worried about all the things that they don't have in order to do it. Okay, now here's the beauty of it. It's going to be a real simple point. Did we not mention it over in verse number 11? For there is no respect to persons with God. That means that ever since the end of the book of Acts, where the process of salvation is the exact same way that we still have it to this day, that at the moment that you believe, God seals you with the Holy Ghost. He saves you, but you also receive the earnest of our salvation, which is the Holy Spirit. At that moment, you've got everything that God wants you to have. You've got Him... And you've got this so that the Holy Ghost can lead and guide you into all truth to show you all that God has equipped you with. And anybody in here got saved with anything different than anybody else in here that got saved. Right? We all got the same equipment. We all got the same guidebook. We all got the same instructions. God is no respecter of persons. So when it comes to teaching yourself, you don't have to worry that God shortchanged you. You got exactly what everybody else got, which is exactly what God wanted you to have. Okay, but the next thing when it comes to not just equipping, 
Okay? It's about explaining. Okay, you give somebody a pair of scissors that's seen a pair of scissors before, they don't understand what they're for and they don't understand how to use it. Okay, you give somebody a baseball and just say throw it, don't be surprised if they don't throw it towards home plate. You just told them to chuck it. So what are they going to do? They're going to chuck it in whatever direction they were standing in at that moment. Okay, there's a little bit of explanation that goes into it. Okay, you can be standing in a batter's box with the bat. You can know where the strike zone is. You can know where the coach wants you to try and hit the ball. But if nobody's explained to you that if you don't step in that direction, the ball's not going that way. If you're in the batter's box and you step at the pitcher, the ball's going towards the pitcher. If you step towards right field, the ball's going towards right field. If you step towards left field, the ball's going towards left field. That's why first thing that they always it just take a step at the pitcher. Because when you're a kid, you just want the ball somewhere that way. Right? They're just trying to teach you hit it that way. But as you go, you say, hey, well, if you take an open step, you could pull it out the right field, and what would have been a fly ball to center field might end up being a home run. Because the wall's shorter in that direction. Okay, there's a whole bunch of people in the pros who still can't take the ball the other way, which means instead of pulling it, you let it go the opposite direction. Instead of going this way, you send it that way. Right? Well, why didn't that happen? Nobody ever taught them. Somebody may have explained it, but they didn't explain how to do it. Explanation is taking something that's too complicated and breaking it down to where it's digestible to whoever's listening to it, whoever's receiving it. Well, when it comes to teaching yourself, you've got to have enough humility to say, Lord, this part I get. I don't understand this. This is too much for me. Then the ones say, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Lord, I get, I, I believe that you're Christ. I believe that you can do everything that you've said and more. But this part of me that's still got doubt and worry and confusion, help that part. I get this, I don't get this. So help me understand it. Help explain it to me. Now he may not explain it the way that you think it ought to be explained, but he's going to explain it the way that you need it to be explained. But I've told you, this book is not to promote confusion. God's not the author of confusion. This book was given to explain everything that you need to know to have perfect faith in God. Perfect meaning lacking nothing. Perfect meaning that Jesus said if you have faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, you'd be able to say to a mountain, be thou removed into the sea, and it'd be gone. But have faith like that. To have a faith that is truly powerful. How do you do that? You've got to have everything explained to the point where you can, Lord, I understand I'm not going to understand everything. But Lord, I understand what you've explained to me, and that's enough for me to just believe it, to have it settled, so that regardless of what comes into your life, it's still going to be steadfast and firm, unshakable. But how's that happen? You've got to ask God to explain some things to you. Then you've got to be able to explain those things to other people. Because what's the point of faith unless your faith has fruit? Didn't James say that I will prove my faith by my works? I go out and labor not because I'm looking for faith, but because I believe so hard, I'm going to go out and I'm going to show people how real my faith is. I'm going to labor. I'm going to sow, but I'm also going to go out and reap. God said some bring forth ten, hundred. Doesn't matter how much you reap the commandment was to be fruitful people don't understand that God expects them to be fruitful unless the Holy Ghost has explained it to them unless somebody has come by and discipled them and taught them here's how you sow some plant some water God gives the increase you just do what God told you to do but you got to go out into the field and you got to be a part of the planting and then there will be a time you may not be the one that reaps you may be in a different field planting and sowing and watering but God's going to send a worker by that will reap 
what has been sown. Because if God can take care of the sparrow, if God can take care of the lily in the field, if God can take care of me, God can take care of the seed that God put in the ground. He knows when it's time to harvest. He knows when it's time to send somebody by that way. But unless you've explained those things to a person, unless you've had those things settled in your heart, you're going to be sitting there every day pouring water on one plant, and you do know that too much water is a bad thing sometimes. You can drown a plant. Sometimes, sitting there and poking at it every day, you're keeping it from growing roots. Because that which has been planted can't settle. In the parable of the sower, Jesus said that some fell on good ground. Well, the contrast to those that fell on rocky ground, the roots were dried up. The roots weren't able to go deep enough to where it could anchor that plant. The plant died. Well, if you're sitting there expecting God to do something, you keep poking at that seed every day. Don't be surprised when it doesn't grow roots. You're not letting the Holy Ghost do the Holy Ghost work. He said plant water. He'd take care of the rest. If you've planted and if you've watered or if you planted and God told you to go away and he sent somebody else by the water. God knows how much water that seed needs. God knows how much time that seed needs in order to, underneath of the surface, start sprouting those roots before it'll come up through the ground and start looking for sunlight. But if we're sitting there messing with it every day, it's never going to grow. If you go to the hospital and you have to have a surgery where they give you stitches, don't sit there and poke at the stitches every day. You're going to undo something that the doctor meant to do on purpose. And by poking at it and messing with it every day, guess what you're going to do? You're going to open it back up. The situation is going to be the same after as it was before. You know why God wants you to plant water in people's lives? So that Jesus can turn them into something new that they weren't before. But if you keep coming around poking in their wounds where God's trying to close up, the work's never going to get finished. Not because God's not God, but because we tried to do something for God that God didn't want us to do. You know what the Pharisees were doing? They were sitting in the place of God and telling people how they're supposed to live. God didn't need them to do that. God needed them, according to the law, to teach them God expects your best because God loves you. And you ought to love God. Pharisees didn't talk about love too much. They didn't talk about how much God had done for Israel. Instead, they talked about how powerful God was and how we ought to fear Him and we ought to live a life thinking that if we mess up, God's going to kill us on the spot. They didn't talk about how the law spoke of one day that we'd be set free. Just like at the Passover feast where they were set free out of Egypt. They weren't looking for a savior. They were looking for God to come down, sit on the throne, and kill all their enemies. But God said that he, I mean, Abraham, through a little bit of prophetic insight, they're going up. Isaac asked Abraham, hey, where's the lamb? God himself shall supply a lamb. But if God was going to provide a lamb back then, don't you think God was going to provide a lamb that was perfect in his own eyes. They weren't looking for the perfect lamb. They were looking for what made them look the best. They didn't teach themselves. Which is why the name of God was blasphemed among the Gentiles. As the Apostle Paul wrote. He said it was prophesied and it's become true. Because you got a bunch of people out there trying to do their best. But their best isn't enough in order to merit the favor of God. They're going around saying, I'm right with God because I'm doing what Mr. So-and-so said. But all that it's doing is bringing shame, dishonor, and a whole bunch of mess to everything that's associated with the name of God. After you equip and after you explain, you have to lead by example. But I remember many classes where a teacher would grab, back in the day, we didn't have blackboards, they were green. Okay. I didn't know what a blackboard was until I got to college, but they were, for some odd reason, the chalkboard was green, okay? And then they started replacing them with dry erase marker boards. But many a times, teacher grabbed grab a piece of chalk, grab one of them dry erase markers, or if they was really tech and fancy, they'd grab their laptop and then draw it up on the projector. But after they'd sit down and say, okay, 
Remember everything that we covered last week? Well, we're going to take that and we're going to do something different with it. Right? You've already got what you need to know. You just don't know it yet. You've been equipped. We explained last week how you can do this thing. Well, this week, we're going to show you by example how we can take this and do this with it. Something completely new. And they'd stand up there at the board and they'd say, you remember this? Yep, we remember that. We just covered that. Well, you remember this from like two weeks ago? Yep. Well, if you do both of them things, you get a new thing. Wow, do that again. I don't get it. And they'd do many examples. They'd hand out sheets to us that show us, right? Step number one, step number two, step number three, and then you get step number four, which, wow, okay, thanks, we've learned it. It's all that we need is this one piece of paper. No. They show you again and again. And then they hand out these things called worksheets, which I was fine with worksheets. Worksheets is where, right, you take the example that you just showed and you turn it into a habit for everybody else. Right, I just showed you how to do it. Now figure out how to, you know, here's all the steps. But you've got to figure out how to do the steps on your own. Right, you empower the individual. You know what your salvation is about? It's about empowering you, not robbing you of anything. God made you into a new creature that was alive. You were dead. That's empowering. He came and he lived an example of 33 and a half sinless perfection years. Then he had 12 apostles, right? And his disciples that started the church. Well, he started it over in the book of Matthew, but continued the work that he started. Why? So that one day he could get to you and do what he promised to do. Right? But all that example doesn't do you any good unless you know how to use it. You know why God wants you to have faith? So that you can be empowered to overcome doubt, to overcome a world that wants you to be afraid. Right? To live in absolute cowardice because you're afraid of what they're going to do to you. Well, my faith says it doesn't matter what they try to do. It's got to go through God. And if it's God's will, whether I like it or not, it's going to be for what's best. That's empowering. You know what the world wants to do? They want to rob you. You realize that by educating right, your children, raising them in the nurture and admonition of the world, the whole goal is to empower them where they are above the rudiments of this world. They're not enticed with those things that the rest of the world are enticed with. There's only one thing that satisfies them. That's God. That's what the point is. But if you're trying to teach others and you haven't taught yourself how to be satisfied with God, what do you think that does in their eyes? Well, if they say it, but they don't live it, why should I? If they say that I ought to desire God, but I never hear them listening to gospel music, I never see them reading their Bible, I never see them asking me questions about what I read in the Bible that day, Right? If they don't seem excited about it, why should I be excited about it? Why do you think the Apostle Paul wrote, Teachest thou not thyself? If you're not teaching yourself, how can you help or even hope to teach somebody else? If you're not letting God turn you into a more empowered version of that new creature, that king to rule and reign over his flesh, that priest to where you can commune directly with God, if you're not trying to become the better version of that, why would anybody want what you've got? So that question teaches I'm not thyself. That's really the kicker today. As much as I love getting up here and teaching, it's not my job to teach you. It's not the pastor's job to teach you. It's your job to teach you. That's why he gave you the Holy Ghost so that you didn't have to rely on anybody else. But because he loves us, he gives us a place to come out. And it gives us a place to congregate and assemble. Why? So that collectively, as a body fitly framed together, we can go out and do the will of God. But unless we're teaching ourselves, teaching once we get here ain't going to make any difference. Right? So teach us how not to say, what are you teaching yourself? And what you're teaching is what you're going to live out. That's what the world's going to see in you. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.